So welcome everybody that's out there. My name is Herb Garrison and I'm the Associate Dean for Graduate Medical Education. But tonight I'm the Interim President of the ECU Medical and Health Sciences Foundation. Uh, we're thrilled that you're with us. Uh, we're going to have a conversation with the deans and ask them to sort of envision the future. Um, the Medical and Health Sciences Foundation is the fundraising arm for the ECU Health Sciences. That includes the Brody School of Medicine, the College of Nursing, the College of Allied Health Sciences, and the School of Dental Medicine, along with our institutes and um, centers, and also the Lopez uh, Library. I'm thrilled tonight to be with Dr. Jason Higginson, who's the Executive Dean of the Brody School of Medicine, and Dr. Mike Waldron, who's the Dean of the Brody School of Medicine, CEO of Vident Health, which will soon be ECU Health. Uh, our purpose is to meet the deans, to have a conversation with them, to give you a chance to ask some questions. Our audience tonight includes alumni from the Brady School of Medicine and special friends, um, and some faculty as well. We want to uh, bid you a welcome, and uh, let's go ahead and meet the deans. So are you all ready? Sure. Okay. <clears throat> Thursday, November 18th, will go down as a red letter day in the history of North Carolina. Uh, on that day, the UNC Board of Governors was the final governing body to approve the creation of ECU Health as the structure for the integration of the Brady School of Medicine and Vitant Health. And on that same day, the North Carolina General Assembly passed and Governor Cooper signed the budget that included funding for a new medical education building for the Brady School of Medicine. After years of prelude and months of intense preparation, what was it like to finally have all this work come to fruition? Wow. <laughs> so we didn't get prepped with these questions. So, um, Some of them you did. just start, start with, with, you know, well, first of all, I just seeing some of the names um, that we went through quickly, I think it's a testament to what I always say is what I love about Eastern North Carolina and uh, the most and is emblematic by the picture in the in the in the um, atrium of coming into the Brody School mm -hmm. of Medicine, which is about the community coming together to solve hard problems and the leaders that have built the foundation for us to get to this point. And um, just so many um, folks that I could call out and I won't because I could just get in trouble with doing it, but that we're part about building that foundation of excellence and 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 understanding um, how to come together to create the foundation for us to take this to the next level. And so there's been a lot of work, a lot of those leaders, and then us um, really working hard to to get to a point where uh, the 40 year engagement ends in a marriage and we get a great wedding gift on that day. And to me, it was it, it was hugely important uh, because I think it is a real manifestation of the understanding um, now more than ever, I think, of what the East faces and that the state and that the governance of our organizations need to come together in a real, well, real way to help us build on that strong foundation. And so it's just a huge, um, a, a huge day um, all the way around that I look at. So many people came together and, and you know, we all know this, right? There were hard times. Uh, there are there will be hard times in the future, but that we all came together and persevered through those hard times to get to get to this point. So it's it's an exciting time. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, you know, I think back on coming here ten years ago, and my recruitment was people in the hospital and people in the school of medicine. And that during that recruitment, I didn't really understand that there was a difference. And then when I arrived, you know, I I saw the promise of what we could do here. I was recruited here to work on infant mortality in the region and run the NICU. Um, and then slowly over time, I started to understand the division between the two and some of the challenges that that put in front of us that didn't need to be there. And so for me, you know, the coming together as somebody who's lived, you know, kind of what I think our frontline people live is uh, we have such promise and many of the things that we can do. And, and it was unfortunate, I think, that we were arranged the way we were for so long. And so this is the first step in doing, you know, really getting to the full potential of what we can do here. And as mentioned, we have so many tremendous challenges. We can't have any self-inflicted wounds that get in the way of, of solving those challenges. And this, I think this really sets us up for the right trajectory to, to solve really hard problems. 
So you're both in new and expanded roles. Uh, describe your roles and who's responsible for what in this new arrangement. Dr. Walter, we'll start with you. Yeah, so I think, first of all, I think let's talk about what what this is first. And so, um, uh, you know, and, and maybe before I do that, I saw Paul Cunningham's name on there. I will call out, I don't want to go through the list, but I will call out Paul because he's been such a great leader here. And frankly, was um, involved in my recruitment here as well as Jason's and uh, many people. Mine. And and yeah, <laughs> and and you know, and I always tell the story. But Paul and I um, took our respective teams to Wallace, North Carolina, and, and, and locked ourselves in a room for a couple of days and talked about the importance of coming together and how could we do that. And I think that that we came out of that with a firm understanding that we're better together and that we do have a common mission. Um, and that kind of led to the beginning of Unify. And so we tried a, a, a way to come together that was probably not the best way in that retrospect, but it was you know, an attempt to do that. And we all know that that didn't work out. But like anything important, sometimes you go down a path and you try to find the solutions and then you come to a roadblock. Well, the intention of, of having combined mission and building an integrated practice and enterprise was still valid. And so, you know, the last few years, the last year or so, um, you know, I think that became more apparent all the way up the chain to the UNC Board of Governors level, the president, and then um, locally um, through all of the organizations. And so just the awareness that we do have a combined mission. And so that gets us to what the joint operating agreement is, which just says we're going to operate together, right? So we are going to um, we, unlike Unify, where it was a change of, there was change of employment, there was a, a merger of assets and things like this, we came up with another path, which is to say, no, we're not going to move people around, there's no change of assets, but we can create a structure that says we're going to combine these and create ECU health with a common mission, with common objectives, common leadership to develop strategies to build a regional academic population health company that drives value for Eastern North Carolina and builds on that great tradition that we um, that I mentioned earlier. So, so um, that's what it is. And so our roles in that are, you know, uh, you know, I'm one human being who has a very long history in academic. My whole career has been in academic medicine and safety net organizations in academic medicine, and I love that space. And it's a hard space. But I have, you know, the healthcare delivery organization that has uh, nine hospitals. And I think let's reflect on what Biden Medical Center is now with what we've recently done with um, Beaufort. Biden Medical Center is the eighth largest hospital in the United States here in Greenville, yeah. North Carolina. So we got this big um, delivery organization that has a lot of capability and a lot of um, hospitals and practice sites. And we have this great school of medicine, which I've said for six and a half years that I've been in North Carolina and advocated for the funding of the new medical school and other things, the highest value medical school in the United States that, um, you know, I can't do all of that. So my job is the leader, just like I um, am with the hospitals to create strategy, overarching objectives, have an organization that could, brings people together uh, to solve those problems and create solutions. And so it's about um, that at my, at my level. And then Dr. Higginson is, uh, you know, the way I explain it, you know, I have a president of a, a hospital or a, a hospital division, Brian Fuller, for example. Well, you know, he does all the day-to-day -day stuff at, at Biden Medical Center and his team's there. I don't do that. I don't have the time to do that. And Jason's role as, you know, a strong leader in Brody is to be the leader of Brody here. And so uh, the organization reports up to, to him. And then we're creating the structures and the teams to bring everybody together to, to implement the strategies. Yeah, and I think the, you know, how this is different than in the past is the this dean CEO role didn't exist. And, you know, that's one of the innovations of ECU Health is that, you know, we had somewhat alignment of what we were doing here in the School of Medicine with the with the larger health you know, care world in our region, this really lines it up. And so, you know, when I'm in a room with, with Dr. Waldrum, I understand what's going on on what is now the Biden side, but soon the ECU health side. And so I can make sure that the functions of the med school 
line up with the larger health goals that we have for the region and make sure that you know what we do in the med school meets that it's the, the mission hasn't changed it's making sure that we actually achieve the mission and that's where we've fallen down in the past so our you know the brody's mission hasn't changed it's my job to manage that and then line it up with the larger mission yeah you know i think that one of the things um is when you have two groups of people two different company groups brody and biden that are in separate rooms looking at the same problem coming up with solutions and then not being able to share data and be able to really have those discussions together, they're automatically going to bump into each other and be less efficient. And so, you know, the the this structure with one leader, which is a very common structure in academic medical centers, and this is very similar to what I had in Arizona, different titles, but very similar, um, that, uh, you know, then it's a lot easier for me to move money from a hospital to to Brody mm -hmm. and things like that. So I can, we can see all of those things. And then I think really importantly, um, you know, supporting the academic missions, research and education and the delivery component, aligning those strategically to transform into the future, future um, becomes really uh, building on the, 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 the incredible assets that we have. And I always say, you know, if you look at Brody and Biden together, we have the building blocks to actually create what the nation needs for rural healthcare in America. And rural healthcare is in significant duress. So we have this great opportunity to take those building blocks that were created by our predecessors, put them together in a new way and be the model. Um, and so um, it, that's an exciting piece, but you can't do that without making some hard decisions, right? And so, uh, you know, you gotta have transparency of data and be able to, so we're gonna be integrating financials and so we can show the stakeholders on both sides, integrated financial statements and how we're performing clinically. And, and, and that helps build trust. And, and, you know, because I think back to that picture in Brody, what I see in Eastern North Carolina is really committed people. And sometimes they get malaligned because they don't get the same information. And so part of our job is to communicate to, that's why we're doing this. Right? Yeah. And so, It'll be easier to act as one when you're structured as one. Yeah, yeah. Um, so just a reminder to people that are out there, uh, you can ask a question in the chat and we're going to get to those. Um, <clears throat> people want to get to know you as people. So I'm going to go into your background a little bit. We all sort of think of Eastern North Carolina as a special place, and we but we all got here by different routes. Uh, I want you to sort of describe the arc of your careers. And, and how that arc led you to be here as leaders in this at this time and place. And Dr. Higginson, we'll start with you. Sure, uh, I, I, there's a lot to unpack there. <laughs> uh, I think what I would say is um, uh, I, my early childhood was in urban Los Angeles. Uh, and then uh, as a slightly older kid for high school, I lived in the rural part. Most people don't realize north of in LA County is a rural region. So. I moved from the heart of downtown LA up into rural uh, uh, Los Angeles County. And, you know, so those two experiences helped form me as a human being. I understood rural challenges and my family did not have a tremendous amount of income. Uh, and so living in a rural environment, very much like Eastern North Carolina in some ways, uh, formed me as a human being. I ended up going to UCLA for undergrad and med school. Go Bruce. Thank you. <laughs> and much like ECU, you know, I think that's one of the things that uh, is powerful about North Carolina is it has a real investment in the in the people of the state through the public education system. So that's how I was educated as an undergrad and then also for med school, I went to UCLA. From there, uh, I went to the San Francisco Bay Area to train in pediatrics um, and I joined the Navy at the same time for one of their health profession scholarships. Uh, and uh, so I, I Joined the Navy, I finished my residency, and instead of going directly into fellowship, I had to spend two years on a small Navy base in the middle of farming country in California. So I was a, in a three-man uh, pediatric group there. I did two years of that, and then the Navy uh, picked me to go to DC, and I was at the Bethesda Naval Hospital and NIH for my fellowship, and then I stayed on as staff there. Uh, and so I spent a total of 13 years on the active duty side of the Navy. And then 10 years ago, after going overseas and handing my kid over to my in-laws, because my wife and I were both deployed at the same time, we decided we need to plant root somewhere. So I, I looked all over the country. I was fully intending to go back to California. 
And I had the lucky fortune of having a recruiter misdial a number looking for an MFM here. And anybody who lived here knows that we need MFM. <laughs> uh, but they got, an, <laughs> they got a neonatologist. And I said, oh, I'm not an MFM. And they said, oh, we have neo on our list too. And so they were looking for a medical director here. Uh, and I had no intention of, I thought, all right, I'll interview. It's a random cold call. Uh, and practice I actually, interview. yeah, I thought I'll practice interviewing. And I came here and I met Ron Perkin. So anybody who knows Ron Perkin, he had a real passion for what pediatrics is in Eastern North Carolina. And he did so many wonderful things here, including that, you know, big part Beautiful of building that children's hospital. hospital. So he walked me through it and he was a Navy man. So we bonded mm -hmm. on that level. Uh, and he, you know, he had this thing called dreams and schemes. And so he talked about what could be accomplished here. Uh, and so after interviewing a lot of places, um, I was really attracted to the mission. It reminded me of, you know, a lot of the good fortune in my life that led me to where I was. Uh, I probably needed to repay. Um, and, you know, and, and I, what was really attractive was there was a big opportunity here. Infant mortality, anybody knows in Eastern North Carolina has always been a challenge. Um, that's what they asked me to come and help solve. Uh, and, and they provided me great facilities and great people to do that. And so I chose to come here and 10 years later, you know, both of my kids have pretty much, you know, grown up here. So they're Eastern North Carolinians. My daughter is actually born in this hospital. Um, and I've had many opportunities to consider leaving and, and things like that. And, and each time the mission and what we do and, and, you know, the incredible people here have, have always led me to say, there's, there's no better place to be. Uh, and so I really enjoyed my time here and, uh, and I see the potential out in the future. So very similar to Ron Perkins' dreams and schemes. This new medical school building has a will have a tremendous impact on this region. Um, and the things that ECU Health is gonna bring, it is only gonna amplify that further. So for me, it's, it's been a wonderful journey getting here. Uh, and I, I, I just couldn't be happier uh, with what we do. And, you know, I'm on in the NICU right now, as you know, and, yeah. and um, I can see it was good when I got here and I can see a lot of the things that we now do really well where we, you know, one of my big plans, one of my dreams and schemes was to get us into the neonatal network, which is a competitive NIH research network. And I turned that over to Dr. Moore, who now runs the NICU, and they're the number one enroller in every NRN study. Wow. And so, like, the and that's the highest level of NICU research in the country. So, good things can be done here. And we know, like, you know, you can tour so many areas here where we are, you know, peer excellence. And so, I want to be involved in seeing that grow in other places. And if you're still in the Navy, it's a heavy military place. Yeah, in North Carolina. Yeah, and I, I didn't even mention that after I left active duty, I've spent the last uh, ten years in the in the Navy Reserve, and I spent all of 2020 deployed overseas. So it was it was great to come back to Eastern North Carolina after being gone. Dr. Walden, how did your well, what a great you story. <laughs> and, and I'll just say that you know Jason and I worked together uh, when he was chair and um, doing things in uh, primarily on the fundraising side for. Uh, for the children's hospital, um, and um, but then at the beginning of COVID, we we really got to know each other uh, because he was instrumental in our response. And I think, you know, we could talk about a lot of things that th these organizations have done together that are really important. Disparity work, you, I could go through a long list, but I'll just tell you the COVID response. Um, it, it has been actually world class, and and Jason was very instrumental in in uh, setting that up before he abandoned ship and um, got deployed. <laughs> um, but really great to hear that some of that story. I, I feel like I know him, but I can always learn more. Yeah, my story is, um, it, 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 it ends in the same place, right? Because I think we all come here for mission. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, I, I grew up firmly in the middle class and um, my father, I moved eight times before I graduated high school. Um, and spent five years of my life in Rochester, Minnesota, uh, the end of elementary school and all of junior high, and um, lived on Mailwood Road and went to elementary school and junior high with some of the male grandkids. Wow. And, um, and you can't live in that rural environment without uh, getting impressed on what healthcare can do. My father's not a physician. Um, and, um, and really was the profound impact. And that always just fascinated me. And so I, at, at age uh, 13, um, I knew I wanted to become a physician. And then uh, we moved to Birmingham, Alabama. And um, 
I ended up uh, going to high school, all of high school there, um, and went to uh, Sewanee um, as a pre-med English major um, because I wanted to go to Sewanee to understand and learn humanities. And I felt that there was no better way to learn than to become an English major, um, uh, but I wanted to be a doctor. So I took a relatively hard path um, <laughs> and, and got myself into medical school and went to the uh, University of Alabama Birmingham School of Medicine. Um, after it took me an extra year, I had to try. Um, it was not an easy haul. Uh, so I can really empathize with our students that, you know, have to reapply and all of that. Um, and got in and um, worked hard and, um, and um, had a mentor who was a pulmonary clinical care physician uh, um, who kind of was like, what do you want to do in your life? And it was very clear to me that I wanted to do academics and safety net was really the two major themes. And um, he said, great, um, but you, if, if you wanna do it here, you probably should leave. And so I went back to Mayo and did internal medicine. Um, and I had an opportunity, it was a really a very significant part of my story, which ends up leading here. Um, I was offered a fellowship at, at Mayo in pulmonary critical care and offered one back at UAB. Um, and um, my wife and I decided that a large uh, inner city diverse uh, safety net organization was better than a place that takes care of rich people, frankly. Mm -hmm. And so we made a hard decision to go back home. Uh, uh, in some respects, it was hard. Um, and uh, went back to Birmingham and had a, an over, year, over 20 year history as a leader um, at UAB, um, became a pulmonary critical care physician during my fellowship with uh, the institution sent me to the Harvard School of uh, Public Health where I got an epidemiology degree in the school of um, um, it, in a program called clinical effectiveness, which was really about how doing clinical trials or how do you measure and affect healthcare and improve healthcare. And so it was right at the beginning of the healthcare uh, improvement movement. And, and that was really a very significant um, uh, part of my career, uh, which led to me working at UAB, really integrating and, and, and how do we improve the systems of care. I became a tenured full professor, was, my track was education um, and service and did you know, some research, but not a lot, mostly service and, and education. I was known as an excellent educator there and um, just loved academic organizations and became the CEO of the hospital there, um, which is uh, the ninth largest hospital in the country, a very large hospital, and really learned about the issues, um, these complex issues that we face in academic organizations. Did a lot of integration work there, but that led uh, me to um, um, career advancement reasons um, to the University of Arizona, where I was the um, CEO of the University of Arizona Health Network, which I mentioned a little bit earlier, the structure there was uh, the dean reported to me as the CEO. So it's, it's the titles are different, but um, it was a in more integrated structure than we had here. And as you, I think most people know, I sold the organization to actually um, invigorate the academic missions of the University of Arizona School of Medicine. And um, I'm very proud of the work that we did there and, and helped that organization. Um, but that essentially put me on, uh, uh, on the job uh, trail. And I had a lot of opportunities to look at a number of places. And I'll just tell you, the first time I came to Greenville, it was um, like, you know, <laughs> probably, we all have that experience. probably not, <laughs> probably not, right? And, and, and my wife, I'll, uh, I tell the story, you know, uh, after the interview, I knew it went well. And there were some people that are on this chat were in, in, the, in the room. Um, you know, I was leaving and I said, honey, you know, I think the interview went well, but I don't think Greenville's for us. Mm -hmm. It was a cold, rainy February day. And, and she said, you know, why? And I said, well, it's just really remote and it's out there. And she said, well, that's what you love to do. Mm -hmm. So, so keep an open mind. And then we came back and since then, it's just been a really non-stop. Non mm -hmm. it, it's been, a, and it's a love story, right? Um, and, and I think that in that, you know, we all know the hard things, right? And so in that six years that I've been here, we've had two 500 year hurricanes. We've had a pandemic that's been the most significant thing that has affected our society and our, in our world. 
um, with more lives lost and American lives lost of uh, anything that we um, can measure in modern times. And you know, there's been dysfunction between our organizations in that time. It was very difficult um, for all of us and me especially. Um, but staying true to the reason that we are here and that mission and, and being committed to figuring out these hard problems. And so um, it comes back to why I left Mayo really. And, and if you look at disparity work, how we really invigorate our communities and support our, our folks, how we give access to medical education to the students that we, you know, underrepresented um, groups that, that need um, their lives, their families' lives and generational changes for them. You know, it's just a great um, um, set of issues that are tough, right? This is the toughest healthcare market in the United States and this is a tough place. But if you're gonna spend the last part of your career that you've been on that track for 30 years, why not spend don't make it a breeze yeah why why spend it in a, an easy place yeah. right you know we're both intensivists we run your need not right mm -hmm. we run the problems that's where we go mm -hmm. and so it's like well if, the, if you're going to spend your time why not spend it where you have value yeah, so absolutely. and hopefully i you know my you know my intention is to help the organization and help brody and and um and engage with our communities to help lead these important conversations that get us through these issues so there's, um, the time's going by faster than I thought. I, I want to, and we're going to get to- Oh, by the way, I don't, have, I don't have COVID. Yeah. So I've been <laughs> tested. Been tested. And so I, I do have a cold. <clears throat> I don't have the influenza uh, or resp uh, RSV or COVID, so. I want to ask a big question. Um, we, we, when you sort of said why ECU Health came about, you sort of look, we're looking back. It was almost- inevitable it was we're, we're together already let's get together and do better L looking forward uh, you know simon sendak talks about start with why yeah what, what's the big problem big problems we're going to be working on it, we, we've got a lot of logistical stuff to work on and get organized and all that but but we're doing that for a purpose talk about what we're going to do in the next five years and how we're going to make the world a better place so I, I think we hinted at it already. The you know the mission isn't going to change. So the why is the mission, and our our mission is you know one open up medical education to a diverse candidate pool. And you know I'm a product of a similar sort of mission. I think that's really laudable, and you can make generational change doing that. I think secondly, you know we live in a region that has terrible health outcomes, and so we're going to go right at those problems and improve the health of people of Eastern North Carolina. And then further, you know, the whole state has a challenge of creating primary care physicians, and that's what Brody's mission is. So that hasn't changed. And Biden's mission is a, to improve the health and well-being of the people of East, Eastern North Carolina, and, and that wraps around all of those missions. So I, I think that is yeah. the why. Yeah. So that's the why. And so, but I think then you get to how, right? And 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 I and so you look at the big issues, right? And and so. Um, the why is is the mission and and the why is because we can do it better together and you know I think we've talked a lot about about Brody and the importance of this because officially that's the structure but let's be clear I mean the biggest issue that is facing really all industries but clearly Eastern North Carolina and healthcare is workforce and so nursing dental school I mean we've got we've got great allied health sciences, allied health sciences. Yeah. we've got great professional schools that can help lead to build those solutions. And it can't be, you know, it, it's got to be multi, uh, I mean, interprofessional education and practice. And, and so, you know, I, I could, uh, and so this is the best thing that anybody that an attending can do. So I'll turn the question back to you and say, okay, well, reflect on, <laughs> uh, reflect on, reflect on the work that, that you led on creating the rural residency training program, right? Which is really a small, but it was a small, but big deal, yeah. right? That that happened from primarily because, you know, really one leader said, we're gonna do it, right? And converge with our vision. I mean, right, yeah. and, so, and so we energized the groups to create those solutions and we got funding for it. And so I think it's, I think it, it, why ECU Health? Because I think a common brand um, you know, I always say that people, our market is 
on the other side of 95 and is in New York and is in, in these communities where we're trying to recruit people to, well, from. And so, you know, recruiting to Biden, you know, <laughs> you know, Brody is just, it, 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 we, that's, a, that's a self-inflicted wound right there, right? So yeah. it, it's going to the market and saying, we're ECU Health, here we are creating these solutions to create a regional rural um, population health company um, organization that educates the future model. So that gets to the interprofessional and, and, and build that and show that people want to invest in it and people want to be part of building something of meaning, just like what we all talked about, right? Mm -hmm. And so that's an exciting thing. And so that's the why and, and, and gets us to creating these solutions that are really important. Um, our communities need those solutions and it can't be on the back of just creating more doctors and, and uh, it's telehealth, how do we integrate it's telehealth? Right. It's, yeah. it's, it's this integrated uh, holistic um, set of um, solutions that, you know, I think we're only starting as an industry, I think we're only starting to see, okay, how do we put all these things together in a meaningful way? And it reminds me back when we first did EHRs, you know, it, I always tell people, we went from paper to first generation EHR, nobody had ever done that before. That right. was a hard <laughs> transition, right? We basically made it's like from file cabinets. To the car. Yeah, yeah, we made file cabinets of the electronic thing. <clears throat> so we're in that transition, but you know, that's an exciting time. And, and our communities, let's be clear. I mean, I was in one of our rural communities today um, you know, our communities need these solutions. They're, they're struggling and they need to recruit. We've got an aging population with a high burden of disease. I'm not as good as Dr. Cunningham. I can't go through that list um, <laughs> that he so eloquently oh, could, could, could do. Um, but, that, you know, it's this high burden of disease, an aging population that, that needs us to bring solutions to them. And Brody's got a great tradition of that. This, you know, the other schools, um, the dental school. Um, I mean, we just have so much to bring to that. And I think how we come together to do that is so important. So that to me is the why. That's the why also, uh, because our communities depend on us to do that. So I know um, we mentioned the, the, the funding for a new medical education building. A lot of people are excited about that. <laughs> we're, we're actually in the-, the We're excited. We're very excited. About that. We're, in the, we're in the Brody building right now, um, which is old. Out, it's, yeah. you know, lived its purpose. Uh, I'm sure everybody would want to know what's the timing of the building? What's, um, uh, what impact will it have? Uh, how will it be figured into all the other changes going on? Yeah, I think the, uh, you know, so the timing uh, is as quickly as we can do it, but- It takes uh, a while to design a Yeah, you have to design and then you have to build. And you also have to get input in the middle of that process. And, and many of the things that Dr. Walder mentioned tonight, like making sure that we have interprofessionalism built into our medical education and, and those sorts of things are critical to designing the correct space. Um, and then I think the, the other aspects of that are, uh, you know, we, we want to expand the Brody class size. And so figuring out how to utilize that building. To help. So we have two limitations on that. One is uh, this building currently Sorry, can't sir. support you know, just the, the class sizes. Um, and then, uh, you know, the, the other aspect of that is the clinical spaces. And so ECU Health opens that up, not just for doctors as mentioned, but all of our allied health uh, people who need clinical rotations are, you know, like what is the biggest problem we have right now? Nursing shortage. I walk in the NICU and I panic every day when I see the ratios, mm -hmm. uh, you know, so all these outcomes matter and, and figuring out ECU Health the building will be a big part of that and making sure that it's the right uh, layout and space and design to, to meet those goals. So we're looking three to five years, I think is three there's would be a, very optimistic. Yeah, yeah, there's a lot. We're very excited. It's a really exciting project. Haven't done you know a number of large, large capital projects. It's always exciting, but they do take time and you want to get them right. I mean, when I built the, the NICU, um, uh, the Children, Women and Infants facility at UAB, I told my team and, you know, we're going to build it like our kids are going to use it. And lo and behold, my, my daughter and my granddaughter um, went to school there. Went, had their, my first grandchild was yeah. born there. And my daughter almost died of, of severe help in the facility mm -hmm. that I had designed that way. So we want to have it be like that, right? We want to build it right. And, 
and go through the process. And so we don't want to be too rushed, but we we really want to bring it online. We can't expand this class size, you know, fast enough. And I'll tell you, the board of trustees have already kind of put the gauntlet down. You guys move fast, and and we're not going to let the cash flow issues with the way the money's coming from the state stop us from moving fast. So don't let that be the reason. And so um, we're gearing up. Um, I've interacted with the AAMC just yesterday to get the list of schools that have the most contemporary buildings so we can take group, you know, and do a field trip and get some ideas and get some design work started. And so it's an exciting time. So one of our uh, questions that's come in already from the chat and the question and answer relates to one of y'all's topics I know that you're concerned about and working on. And, and it's the university mission of student success. So how does ECU Health and the new building, how does all that work together to, to sort of uh, translate into student success? Well, let, let me start a little bit. And I think that one of the things that both Jason and I are really concerned with is making sure that our current students, that we have the infrastructure uh, to help our current students be successful. And, and I just want everyone that may not be aware of this to the, 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 the medical students, the M1s and M2s nationally are probably the most fragile group of medical students that we've had because of the pandemic. And that's, uh, I'm on the AAMC board. It's a, it's a national conversation. And, and so, um, and we feel like we've under-resourced to that support here. And so Jason and his teams are working that. So that's, that's a priority number one issue. Um, and then the other comment um, that I would make is that not just medical students, but uh, nursing, because we've mentioned it a little bit, is, is having good uh, preceptorship sites and, and, and places, which is a big limitation for clinical um, uh, environments. And so one of the things that you know, we, ECU Health has already allowed us to do is we're mapping all of the Biden sites, what providers would be interested and how do we use this capacity for preceptorship, that we have for preceptorship to, um, and, and, and so Lori Bass and I and, and others are working with groups to, to do that so we can make sure that um, we know at least the current state and leverage what we have. Um, and then, you know, there's, I think, a lot of different programs that we're conceptualizing to support our students. But um, yeah, and I think, yeah, I mean, you should know as, you know, running GME here, education happens in a continuum and, and it overlaps. And so making, you know, having one organization so that you can monitor in every type of learning environment, whether it's classroom, clinical space, you know, learning out at a distal place, those are all important things. And, and I think this really helps structure us so that we can have firm lines of communication about maintaining standards, making sure that the education is good, putting people in the right context to learn what they need to, to learn. You know, because I think that, you know, managing educational plans is important. And then as mentioned, you know, one of the concerns I have in the school of medicine is have we under-resourced the support structures around our students so that, uh, you know, that when they arrive here, we know they're capable. I mean, the AAMC has clear data. If you select these types of students, they should They'll be succeed. able to graduate and right. do well. Uh, but you have to have the right learning environment for that to occur. And so that's one of the that's one of our big focuses in our first, you know, 90 days here was yeah. really evaluating the educational program and making sure that we're producing the best type of students that we can. The um, there's been a record number of applications for medical school in the yeah. face of a, a pandemic. Um, Dr. Waldron, you, you sit on the board of the AAMC. Yeah. What, what's the future of medicine? What's it going to look like in five or 10 years? Is it, is it going to be, it's not going to be like when I practiced. Uh, well, how's, how's the world you know, going to change and how's it going to stay the same? Well, I, I always say, uh, <coughs> you know, predicting the future is <laughs> hard. I will say, you know, going back to what I said earlier that we have the building blocks for the future is really a lot of it is. Um, um, me saying that is informed by what the AAMC says we're going uh, to be. Um, and so uh, it really is getting into community engagement. And, and so how do we create medical students very similar to what we did uh, with the rural residency training program? How do we um, teach uh, about these social issues, social determinant um, 
then how do you engage with communities? It's not uh, going to be um, just write a prescription and all sodiums and, and potassium. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so, and it's going to be interprofessional. And I think, you know, the idea of the old days where, you know, as the uh, physician, you do everything and it, you're going to have to rely on health coaches and, and um, nurse practitioners and, and new models and then engaging in our communities in different ways. And so I think that that takes different um, ways to educate mm -hmm. folks. And so um, it, the environments they're in and then the skill sets and, and those kind of things. And so, um, you, you know, I think that that's what it's gonna look like. And so um, that's gonna be hard for us older people, right? Mm -hmm. To accommodate, um, but the young kids, I don't think, I mean, I, I they don't know what any way different. Right. right. And when I when I interact with the, with the students, you know, they've already they're they're already there. Yeah. Right. They're they're studying social determinants. They know about disparities. They they know about these issues and they want to engage in them to, to solve them. So um, and they're already working on them. So, yeah. I mean, let's just get a, uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, just a quick one out of the way is the joint operating agreement uh, going to be available to the public? And Rob said, make sure. That, Calumet's public record. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 it it's out. Um, I don't know if it's on a DCU website or. If, I don't know um, that it's on it, but there's if you Google it. Yeah, it's I out. think yeah. the you know the it's a public, observer has a link to it. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's out, and and I'll just say that it really just says you're going to work together to be financially integrated and um uh and to be clinically integrated and well, under a common brand. It really isn't prescriptive. It just says you're going to work together. And importantly, for everybody to understand, again, I mean, we just can't say this enough. Nobody's losing their job or moving or anybody. The only mm -hmm. person that's changed the job context is me because <laughs> I'm now duly employed. Um, and um, I felt that was important, which is, again, a common thing in academic organizations. Um, and so um, it, it really just says that. And then the other thing is, is that um, we're tied together. And it's hard to undo. And so the idea is the analogy that some people in these kind of arrangements make is no, we're all gonna get in our canoes and and and, and go to that island, then we're burning the canoes. So we're gonna we are together. <laughs> we're, gonna stay. We're, we're 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 on the <laughs> island together, right? And so it, it's really hard to undo. Um, and, and I think one important thing that you know is frequent feedback is that we're trying to give. We know we don't have enough, we are under you know, resource and personnel. So there's no intention at all that we have too many people. It's just getting people arranged in the right ways to work together, to solve problems in the same room, you know, as opposed to having two rooms solving the same problem. Yeah, and so when people hear people like, you know, me with a suit on, um, talk about efficiency, they think it means job loss. From my perspective, we were underserving the market. Um, and this is that's true historically, but I think the issues with the pandemic, have, the, the big biggest tectonic plates that are happening right now is massive physician, nursing and other healthcare professional um, workforce. And so you can read it about other industries, but and this is a huge issue because um, uh, it, it, there's not quick fixes for that. So how we deploy tele and how we build in our professional um, teams and all of those things are going, we're going to be forced to do it. And so we have the, the building blocks to do it, but it's, it, it isn't about, you know, getting rid of people. It's about bringing people together to serve, you know, and create that future state. So Sue Collier, who's an America's yeah, member we, of our board, yeah, and <laughs> leader and uh, colleague for a long time, she yeah. says, how will you engage the community to help develop and implement innovative solutions, so community engagement? Well, it's such a great um, um, question. And as I mentioned, it's um, the newest pillar of the strategic plan for the AAMC. And I'll, I'll say that um, community engagement work is extremely difficult work. Um, two, as I mentioned today, I was in one of our communities and one, one of the ways you do community engagement is you actually, yeah. <laughs> you go to them and you yeah. talk to them about what their needs are and you listen. Um, very intently, and so as a leader, um, I do that, and then and and create teams that will do that. And then I think most importantly, in that where healthcare nationally has failed with good community engagement, is is really that um, you know we tend to think we know the answers for a community, and we give them the solution that we think that they need. 
And that is not the way to do community engagement. And we learned a lot about um, COVID and during COVID, I'll tell you, ECU and Biden came together and did really great community engagement work. Um, and we're nationally, I mean, we, uh, we're, we're getting national recognition on this work, um, but uh, the, the importance of that is, is agency to the community. And so they get to dictate the solutions. And then when they say that they need these things, we come and say, okay, well, we're bringing you the solutions that you need in the way you need them. And so um, that's hard work because um, in some communities there's a historic anger and you got to work through that. Um, um, but it's really, you know, it's what back to the rural training track, right? It's what we conceptualized when we did the rural residency. Mm -hmm. um, and I've mentioned that a few times. So I'll just say a little bit about that because I think it's emblematic about that. But how you do it is you you embed people in those communities and then you you create the environment for them to be successful and their expectations. So they're in these family medicine programs that Herb and the family medicine group and GME group built. Um, uh, was something we kept conceptualized and got supported. Thank you to all of our legislators for supporting the new school and the rural residency training track and other things. But the program was to create physicians that can take care of patients, but also know social determinant issues and know the community needs. So they know how to interact with the school superintendent and they know how to work with the economic development organization to become part of the community leadership that helps that community be successful. And so that's a whole different set, skill, skill set. Um, and they don't expect that on the regular residents. Right. Regular and, so, and so that program was built to, to do that. Mm -hmm. And we'll learn and we'll be perfect right out of the gate. But, um, you know, it will help us engage with our communities. Um, and, and, and then I think the expectation, you know, from my perspective, um, the expectation that our leaders be engaged in their communities. And I, I, that's really hard for physicians uh, because, uh, you know, I do a lot of it, but I wasn't trained in it. I just had to learn how to mm -hmm. do it. And so I think the rural residency program is a way, is the beginning of us starting to train our folks that how do you engage with legislators? How do you be engaged in the community? So. Yeah. yeah, and I think the other aspect of what we do is, you know, if you play the long game, you go to the community, like our students are from the communities that yeah. we serve, and you grow, you know, part of being, you know, able to, to have the community have a voice is to grow somebody from the community to have a voice that has influence, and so, you know, picking med students or nursing students or, or students in the other schools, picking them from the community, making sure that that's our focus, if you're playing the 20 year game, that person is the dean one day or is the, you know, the person yeah. in power one day. And I, I think that's the other long game that we're playing. Yeah, and, and, and that's actually happening. During the, some of the work that I talked about during COVID, it, it happens on so many different levels, but you know, during the community engagement work with COVID, we did these pop-up vaccination job fair kind of events. And we're hiring people from the communities because a lot of those communities need entry-level jobs. We need workers. And they need entry level jobs, and then we navigate them up. You know, so you come in in the EVS or food service. We help you get your GED, um, and then you become an NA. And I mean, and and if you talk to our team members, there's a lot that have figured that out themselves. Mm -hmm. So our job should be how do we like facilitate that? Right, right. How do we right. make that happen systematically? Right. right? right. And so that's about bringing the whole community up and giving um, opportunity. So uh, we just have a few more minutes. Um, but one, we've talked about research, we sort of barely touched yeah. on it, but one of the questions is, can you comment on the integration of research opportunities with PCU <laughs> Health to improve population health? But maybe yeah. start with just research in general. What, what happens with research? So I think, you know, we, we, I think you call it the three-headed monster. We have, we, you know, we have uh, lots of infrastructure on main campus. We have lots of infrastructure in Biden. And, and Brody right now, and then even in the other schools. And, you know, there's lots of hard walls between uh, working through those things. So that's one of the things we want to do is dissolve those walls and have just a more fluid pathway to get things done. I've been one of those frustrated researchers in this environment, trying to get approvals in multiple sites, basically filling out the same forms, that sort of stuff. So that's one aspect of it. I think the other aspect of it, you know, more broadly to that question is we have a lot of data you know, in our EHR and a lot of our other data sources that speak to the region. And we've done some work in COVID 
utilizing that data at a high level. Um, so it's figuring out how can we use what is already here to get you know important valuable research done and 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 you know grease the skid so that it happens much quicker. So dissolving those walls and then utilizing the strength that we have. I mean we cover 29, 30 counties. We have a lot of data and being able to harness that to to affect good outcomes is is really where we're headed. We yeah. have a cool laboratory. Oh yeah. yeah, but we have all these self-imposed barriers. Mm -hmm. And so ECU Health, right? I mean, one of the major things is getting uh, is getting the agreements where we can we we don't have to have every researcher negotiate a, a data use agreement, right? We just have a global uh, ECU one, Health. One, we have yeah. one, you know. So it's our data, and so and so. How do we? Our job is to take the barriers down for people that want to do great things, and so that's part of it. Research is complex here. Uh, ECU Health will help us take that some of those barriers down for sure and, right. and it's vitally important and i think importantly you know i think there'll be a very quick lift and, and in a year or two people won't know the difference right because what a lot of people on the ecu side don't know is that biden has an equal amount of clinical research done in it across the region and sometimes with ecu but sometimes not and we want ECU to get credit for that. So when we're looking at it, because that's what other integrated academic yeah, organizations right. do, right? right? Just right. They, 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 when they, you look at their metrics, I can tell you that their community hospitals and their stuff, they're counting that. And mm -hmm. so we want to make sure that we're getting credit for all of the great work that is being done. Yeah. And then we want to make sure that our, we have mission aligned research long term, because as I mentioned, the country needs what we um, have the ability to build and we want to be able to show that and we want to be able to extend our research capacity to to all of our environment and give them the opportunity to participate in that and that goes back to community trust and engagement really mm -hmm. and so um, during covid we did some, um, some really great community trust engagement work um, you know with communities that don't want to be tested they don't believe covid's real and those kind of things and, and just engage with them. Well, if you think about that, that helps us deal with population health trust issues and also research trust. And so how do we overcome some of the historic barriers um, in getting participation by certain communities into our research? Um, we just have uh, a few more minutes. Um, I'm, I wanna get you to answer one question and then we're gonna ask you to sort of reflect on philanthropy because we're a philanthropic <laughs> organization. But one question here was uh, how and when will patients specifically see tangible benefits of the creation of ECU Health? And maybe trim that down to say, when are we going to, so January 1st is less than a month away. When do we start seeing ECU Health? And Yeah, so I think, you know, this, I describe this as a, as a marriage. We've had a 40 year engagement. We, we um, got the marriage license. Everybody signed off that we're getting married January 1. And, and, and January 1, we're going to figure out who's taking the garbage out, who's feeding the dog, and who's doing the checkbook, mm -hmm. right? And so um, it, it, we're in process of putting all of that stuff together and figuring that out. And it will evolve, right? So it's we want our team members and our positions and chairs and people to be part of building that future state. So it will be an evolutionary process. Um, part of that is creating the brand. We didn't want to spend the time or money creating a brand until we had something done. Now we did some pre-work because we got more confident during the fall. But now that we have an agreement that we're working through that, we hope to have the final, what does it look like? It will be very, um, you, you know, um, it, the ECU Pirate Nation will be happy with it. Oh yeah, they'll be very happy with it. Um, it'll be purple. <laughs> it'll be purple and it'll be, it will, you know, it will pay homage to the important, you know, aspects of, of, of this environment, which is ECU. And so it will be real and, and, but we want to get that right. And then, so probably sometimes in the January, um, we'll, start, uh, seeing we'll, we'll yeah. start seeing stuff. We're doing a combined strategic planning process to bring a lot of these things we've talked about together to have, make sure we have a plan. We can energize the teams, get the input and have them build these things. And, um, and, and so all of that's going to come to a, a head in March timeframe. Uh, we want to roll out the strategic plan with the board's um, new brand. Um, maybe we'll be, we will be further along on the building. And so 
Um, you know, it, it will be an evolutionary thing, you know, and then getting the processes where we have one bill and, you know, the back end kind of process stuff where that's going to take a little bit more time. But within a year, you know, people will feel that mm -hmm. it will be, you know, here's the number you call to get access to health care. You don't have to call two different. All of those things will be happening over that time. And, and so you're on there by fast. It'll go by fast. And I think the reality is, uh, you know, like anything in medicine, when you feel it, it's it's hard to say, you know, those tangible things. But I can already tell that many of our processes, we have the people, we have a lot of the leaders now in rooms talking about the future, and it's already affecting the present state of how we do things, how we're going to move forward. And so, you know any big organization like this, you make decisions every day that affect people's lives mm -hmm. and, and most importantly in healthcare, save lives. And I think we're already seeing the benefit yeah. of having the right people in the right room. Well, and the energy, and I just think this for this group is really important. You would, the energy around that, when I, I get really energized, I hope people see that I'm really excited about where we are and I think we're very excited. But having, uh, for instance, we were in a room and having one of the chairs who's involved in part of the planning part and stuff, who's been here a, a, a quite a while, say this is the most exciting thing that's happened in Eastern North yeah. Carolina uh, because people want to be part about building. You know, we get to create our, uh, that's true every day, right? We get to create our reality. And so having people in an organization that understands its mission, that's aligned with that and the leaders coming together, um, you can feel that yeah. uh, for sure. To support student success, have scholarships, research, Lots of other places get lots of philanthropic support for that. Yeah. You're both donors. Yeah. Reflect on giving and being a donor and why we would want to give to this new thing and these things coming together. Well, I, I would just say we thank you for anybody that has, um, as you mentioned, um, we give. And um, it's a great mission and, um, and it's a great objective. And so we just appreciate the support. And why? Because it, it, it's very impactful. I always say a dollar spent here, and I say this to our legislators, the incremental dollar spent in Greenville or in Eastern North Carolina is a lot larger than it Big is. Right? Yeah. A lot larger than any yeah. place else in the state. So your return for that um, gift is really large for these type of students, for our type of mission is just, it's, it's really large. And then I would say we have a lot of needs, right? And so supporting our students, um, you know, we're we're um, going to be kicking off a kind of mini campaign around um, how uh, we uh, get matching dollars for a $10 million gift that's already been created um, to create an endowment that helps support our students. Um, and so, um, you know, that's something to be excited about. And, and, and so we want folks to... Um, know how important it is to our students. So all you have to do is talk to the students. Yeah. yeah. And they'll say, I want to help this. And and yeah. and you know, and again, I think this is so important. You know, I always these guys are always hate because I, I sound redundant, but money's fungible. If you sit in my seat, mm -hmm. money's fungible, right? And so we get in these weird conversations. Well, I you know if I give to Biden, it goes to the goes to a building. If I give you know, but during the Cancer Center, which is the largest campaign that, that we've had as a healthcare delivery organization, during that campaign, I raised probably the, some of the, you know, a couple million dollars. Well, it was a three million dollar yeah. gift for Brody. Right. Right. Because I know that that money coming to Brody helps the Cancer Center mm -hmm. be successful. Right. And so I, it doesn't matter to me, yeah. that, you know, whether you give bricks and mortar or you support our students or you do endow professorship, that helps the enterprise ECU Health be successful because we need all of that. Yeah. We're done. Thank you, Dr. Higginson. Thank, Thank you, Dr. You. Waldron. Thank you all very much for tuning in. We'll do it again. Uh, we'll say good night. Good night. <laughs>